the impact of climate change on sport. Sport is huge, it's one of the biggest industries on the planet. The impact of poor weather on beachgoers. It's very, very easy to get on an inflatable and to get taken out to sea. And building a climate resilient economy. You know, an aeroplane of the future is probably going to be built today, so it has to be adapted for what, what might look like in the future. It's Friday, the 21st of May, and you're listening to Weather Snap from the Met Office. Hello, I'm Claire Nazir, and this is Weather Snap, the insider's guide to the week's weather brought to you direct from Met Office HQ. This week, the BBC released a report looking at the impacts of climate change on sport. Sport 2050, a collaboration between the BBC and scientists here at the Met Office, suggests profound changes to the way future sporting events will need to be managed and the kind of weather conditions individual sports may face. With more details, here's climate correspondent Graham Madge. As research continues, it's clear global climate conditions are set to change. Those changes will affect many aspects of life, and that includes an area of considerable human interest and activity, sport. So what kind of challenges might the future sporting world face? That was the question set by the BBC. My name is Dave Lockwood. I um, am BBC Sports editorial lead for sustainability. BBC Sport is keen to use sport and bring the impacts of climate change to wider audiences. We think that there are audiences across the globe and BBC has that global reach that maybe aren't as aware of some of the science and some of the impacts of climate change as others are. The BBC report imagines the sporting world of 2050. Why did producers focus on that period? We chose 2050 because 2050 is sort of a generation away. It it could be somebody's children. It could be, you know, oneself. You know, we can imagine 30 years from now. And also what I was told by, you know, the experts is that If we choose 2050, there's a smaller differential between, you know, high emission scenario, low emission scenario. You're going to get a more accurate prediction. One of those experts tasked with projecting future conditions is Met Office climate scientist Helen Hanlon. My role was to analyse future climate projections to assess how the test cricket match in Melbourne and also an imagined football World Cup in China could be affected by increased extreme weather due to climate change. Before we could do anything, we had to prepare climate data by calibrating the output against recent observations and extracting the part that was relevant for the specific location and sporting event at that time of year. So we calculated the count of days with the present day climate data and also future climate data and then found the difference between the two. Generally, as emissions increase, we predicted that there would be an increase in the number of days that would need the sporting event reorganising somehow. The climate calculations looked at a number of sporting events and scenarios. The challenge was to narrow down a wealth of data. What we were doing were tailoring information to be relevant to these events um, that would be of interest to a wide population. So as such, what we did was distill what was quite a large document full of detail into a series of facts that told an interesting story about how future sport would likely face some challenges due to climate change. Those challenges include periods of extreme heat, water shortages and increased frequency of storms. So how well prepared is the world of sport? David Lockwood. I think that sporting organisations are increasingly aware. I think that awareness started a while ago. I think, you know, some are more advanced than others. Um, I think there are areas that are slow to act and slow to engage. um, And it's not necessarily my place to call them out. Um, But that is a message, not so much that I necessarily formulate myself. That's from speaking to, you know, experts and people who, you know, perhaps know more than I do. With climate change hitting the headlines almost daily, will this BBC report cut through the noise? And is sport really a useful way to communicate science? 
finding new and interesting ways to communicate the impacts of climate change is one of our main goals. So I would like to think we could do more projects like this to communicate more on specific impacts of climate change and to broaden our understanding of what the implications are for reaching higher levels of global warming. The feedback overall has been really positive. We have had engagement from teams and from athletes themselves. This is something that will affect all areas of life. Sport is huge. It's one of the biggest industries on the planet. So actually, it's entirely valid to look at it. And if you'd like to see that full BBC report on the impacts of climate change on sport, visit bbc.co.uk forward slash sport. Last week, the Met Office hosted the virtual climate event Science for a Resilient Future. Next week, it's the turn of business with the launch of Industry Climate Week, a week of webinars exploring the challenges and opportunities climate change presents to business and industry. To find out more, I spoke to Met Office Head of Markets, Ian Cameron. Ian, the Met Office Industry Climate Week, why is this so important? It's really important, Claire. I mean, the, the, the science is proven, the climate is changing, and we're into adaptation now, if you like. It's uh, how are we, as a society and an industry and government, going to work together um, to mitigate against future changes? We know no matter what mitigation efforts we take now, we're going to experience some level of warming in the future, and that emissions to date will continue to impact the climate system over the coming decades. It's a critical time for the business community as they're facing the dual challenge of reducing emissions now, as well as strengthening assets and adapting their business models for the future so they can remain resilient. It's not just about what we do now, but what we're doing for 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years time. A lot of this is fresh ideas. We're going into uncharted waters for many of the business community. But this is not the first time we've collaborated with industry and business. Yes, you're right, Claire. And I think as well, it's, in some respects, it's good for the Met Office. Whilst we sit on all of this expertise, we're not experts at everything. It's all very well as a bunch of scientists that we are basically saying, oh, yes, the world is changing. And, and there is no doubt the world is changing. And adaptation and the conferences that are coming up with COP26 is about how we might be able to limit the impacts going forward. But understanding what those impacts will be and the projections that we have going will help industries to look at their long term investments, because I think sometimes short term investments are whether this summer is going to be hotter than last summer. But actually, if you're looking long term, they're going to have to adapt because there are long term plans that they have to make. You know, an aeroplane of the future is probably going to be built today. So it has to be adapted for what, what might look like in the future. Met Office Head of Markets, Ian Cameron. Last week, we reported on the threat of a cyclone development over the Arabian Sea, close to the west coast of India. This past Monday, the cyclone did in fact make landfall in Gujarat, producing devastating waves, heavy rain and creating significant flooding across Mumbai. Cyclone Taute continues its track northeastwards, close to the foothills of the Himalayas, delivering heavy rain to northern India and Nepal. In the meantime, an area of thunderstorms across the Bay of Bengal is also likely to develop into a tropical cyclone over the weekend, Forecasts suggest it may make landfall across Bangladesh and northeast India next week with the risk of further torrential rain. Over to the tropical North Atlantic and the hurricane season officially begins on the 1st of June. However, a subtropical storm close to Bermuda may be named in the next 24 hours. This would make it the seventh consecutive year in which a storm has been named pre-season. For the latest on all these storms, check out the Met Office Storms Twitter feed. The latest rollback of lockdown restrictions means more of us may now be heading for the beach. This week, the Met Office, RNLI and HM Coast Guard launch a joint campaign promoting safety awareness for beachgoers. Of those, paddleboarders face a particular set of risks, as RNLI lifeguard Henry Irvin explains. Because the cost of the paddleboard has come down so much, we are seeing an increase in people using them who are perhaps not as prepared or don't fully understand how to read the conditions when they're on the water. With our annual beach safety campaign, we're particularly advising paddle boarders to ideally take someone else with them, to wear a buoyancy aid and a leash, and to take a means of communication. So ideally a mobile phone in a waterproof pouch 
and to generally check the conditions before they go. As an organisation, we are really strongly advising people not to take dinghies, inflatable unicorns, flamingos, whatever else you can buy now. Um, they're really designed for the swimming pool and they are extremely prone to the wind. It's very, very easy to get on an inflatable and to get taken out to sea. If you do fall into cold water, try your absolute best to relax and to float on your back for those few seconds until your breathing calms down and you regain control of your muscles. If you're on the beach and you see someone who you think might be in difficulty, call 999 and ask for the Coast Guard. They're the government agency that coordinate the RNLI lifeboats, lifeguards in the UK. Key message is be prepared, be aware. Personally, really looking forward to what might well be a busy summer. Fingers crossed we get some good weather soon and we really hope people can come and enjoy the UK beaches because they're absolutely stunning and it would be fantastic to see people out using our coastline. RNLI lifeguard Henry Irvin. While here at the Met Office we have a seasoned paddleboarder and all-round surf dude, our very own Alex Deacon. Alex, you've just put together some safety awareness films with Henry. What are the weather conditions that paddleboarders need to watch out for? Firstly, I'm an enthusiastic amateur when it comes to paddleboarding and certainly not a surf dude. Um, a couple of things, though, weather-wise to really look out for. And the main thing is wind. It's the wind direction as well. Because if you've got an offshore wind that's blowing from the shore out to sea, that's really dangerous and should be avoided. It feels fine when you get on the paddleboard because it's helping you and blowing you around. But it's really hard there, a lot harder to paddle back to shore and to safety because you're going against the wind. So direction is key. The Met Office website is really useful for that because you can uh, actually go to your beach location and see wind's direction relative to the sea. So that's really important. So we're trying to avoid offshore winds. Uh, lighter winds, uh, more enjoyable to just paddleboard in generally. Calm conditions is what you want. So as little wave as possible. And I uh, really only go out when it's sunny and flat calm, basically. Tell me about sea surface temperatures, particularly through late spring and early summer. Yeah, it's cold. I mean, we all know if anyone's been in the sea here any time of year, really around the UK, it's pretty hard to find a day where it's warm. It's always chilly, but it's particularly cold uh, this time of year. So kind of late spring, it's uh, when the temperatures in the sea are at their lowest. They're only just starting to pick up after the winter lull. And even in the height of summer, you know, sea temperatures are cold. So as we heard there, you know, if you do fall in, which you will do if you're on a paddleboard, certainly not as experienced uh, as, as some, if you're inexperienced like I am, you're like to fall in and if you do be prepared for that cold shock just try and stay calm stay as still as possible but also be aware even if you're on the board even if you don't fall in uh, if it's breezy if you're out on the water it's going to feel cold out there and that will impact your ability to move have an effect on your muscles if you're not experienced don't go out for long and don't get too far away from the shore okay well currently it's very windy but the winds will subside through the beginning of the weekend but there's a lag time when it comes to the effects of wind on waves. Yes, uh, the waves people often think are just related to how strong the winds are, but it's not like that at all. There's something called fetch as well, how far the winds have travelled. Uh, the sea is a very different beast uh, to weather. They're not exactly directly linked. So there will be a lag in terms of how big the waves are. We're seeing very strong winds at the moment across the UK, and that will still be impacting this weekend with large waves around the UK shores this weekend. I wouldn't say it's a good weekend at all to be out on the paddleboard. So how is the weather looking for the weekend overall? Is there any sunshine over the next few days? There are signs of calmer weather, at least, as we go through it next week, but not this weekend. Certainly after the downpours of Thursday and Friday, Saturday looks a lot drier. There'll still be showers. It'll be that classic mixture of sunshine and showers. Some heavy ones likely, particularly across the east, but not as many. A better chance of a drier day on Saturday, especially in the west, but still on the chilly side. The breeze eases a little bit on Saturday as well, but then it picks up once more. On Sunday, another low comes in. That brings more wet weather, particularly in the west. If you're 
in the east on Sunday, decent chance of a dry morning. But even here by the afternoon, the rain comes in. So further wet and windy weather to come at times this weekend. Next week stays showery, certainly for the first half of the week. There are signs of higher pressure and a shift in the jet stream as we go towards the back end of next week. It does look a bit drier, certainly, but it doesn't look, to be honest, much warmer. Thank you, Alex. And as we mentioned, there is a new video that provides tips on staying safe at the beach. You can find that on the Met Office YouTube weather channel. Before we go, here with our usual roundup of the week's highs and lows, Martin Bowles. Here are the weather extremes for last week, observed between Monday the 10th of May and Sunday the 16th of May. The warmest place was St James's Park in central London, which recorded 18.2 Celsius on Tuesday. Night times were mild for most, with considerable cloud cover overhead. However, there were some clear skies in Northern Ireland. Catesbridge in County Down recorded the lowest UK temperatures for three nights in a row. The minimum was minus 2.2 Celsius in the early hours of Thursday. Those clear skies in Northern Ireland also meant that Catesbridge recorded the longest sunshine hours of the week, 13.5 hours on Tuesday. In a week when everybody was talking about the rain, the highest recorded daily rainfall was 49.0 mm at Merrifield in Somerset on Thursday the 13th. That's it for Weathersnap. I'm Claire Nazir. Editor is Adrian Holloway. Weathersnap is a podcast by the UK Met Office.